It's my pleasure to uh, have Lucy Wong, Robin Lee, and Sagar here today uh, to speak a little bit about consumer internet and fintech trends that we're seeing in the market um, from the VC investor perspective. So we had a last minute switch up. Um, Alexa Von Tobel from Inspired had a family emergency, so she can't make it today. So Lucy has uh, very graciously offered to step in for us. Uh, so thank you so much for stepping up to the plate on of such short notice. Of course, and um, we're finally on a panel together. Yes. And, yeah. um, well, exactly. so for benefit of the audience, um, I lead technology um, equity capital markets at JP Morgan. So uh, certainly nice to be here and seeing everyone in, in this space. And I, I'm saying I'm a moonlining investor because my day job is to sell tech IPOs to public investors. So hopefully I, I can shed some light on you know what public equity investors are looking for. Yeah, so again, continuing on that theme of like not only looking at the private markets, but also looking at the effect and the impact on the public markets as well uh, in this period. So I guess before I hand it over to our panelists to introduce themselves, I just want to um, set the stage here a little bit. So the purpose of this panel um, is really to highlight some of the new trends, some of the new products, and some of the new developments uh, in the consumer internet and fintech sectors that VC investors are seeing, and to talk a little bit more uh, about those as well as to talk about how fintech business models are being perceived um, on the public market, uh, which is why you know, Lucy is able to, to weigh in on this here um, in light of the market correction that we've been talking about um, and that everybody's aware of. So yeah, let's hand that over uh, to our panelists for now. Um, let's go in order maybe from Lucy to Sagar. Um, maybe you just share a bit more about your background, uh, some of the consumer internet and fintech investments you guys have made for um, for, for Robin and Sagar, and also some of the IPOs uh, and companies that you've worked with, Lucy, uh, over the past couple of years. Great. Do you want to start? Can I start? Yeah. Sure. Hey, everybody. Uh, Sagar Kulkarni. I'm a partner at a firm called Stripes here uh, based in, in New York City, downtown on the, on the west side. We're a growth equity firm uh, that invests in amazing product companies um, post product market fit. So, you know, from a couple million in revenue to the to the hundreds of millions. Um, there's two two sides to our uh, our business uh, or two focus areas. One is our B2B side uh, that that side invests in predominantly application software as well as some infrastructure software, B2B payments uh, and infrastructure. So I co-lead that team. Uh, and have made a number of our investments in uh, B2B fintech companies, uh, such as Plio, uh, a company called Lithic, as well as a company called Novo, uh, who Michael and the team are here <laughs> in the city today. Uh, we also invest in consumer. So the other half of what we do is, is on the consumer side, both consumer internet um, in predominantly marketplaces, companies like uh, Grubhub, uh, Udemy, uh, I've done a bunch of stuff in uh, consumer fintech, companies like Remitly and, and Flex, as well as physical goods consumer products. Uh, and I've been with the firm about, about six years now, uh, had a prior life uh, as a recovering management consultant and, and private <laughs> equity investor. So good to be here. Thank you. Hi, and I'm Robin Lee. Uh, as you know, I'm with the GGV Capital team. A lot of what I focus on have traditionally been a lot of like consumer internet, which encompasses e-commerce, um, and worked a lot of that with Hans, like Peloton, um, uh, Poshmark, and StockX, to um, a lot of like social investments as well, like um, like Chief, which is here in New York, which is a network of professional women. Um, and then we have um, TikTok, which was formerly Musical.ly that we've invested in as well. And then we do a lot of like SMB food tech and FinTech investments. And so um, from like the food tech side, we had o Odeco and we have Slice. Um, we also have Bowery, which was an indoor vertical farm. Um, and then on the FinTech side, we have a number of investments, which we'll probably talk about, but um, from a firm, which Huey um, was a part of before, a founding um, member, as well as as um, Square from many years ago to like Novo and, and others. And so um, excited to be here. And we are also multi-stage, and so we work very well together up and down and very collaborative in that way. Great. And um, I already introduced myself, so maybe some of the deals that we've worked on in the last couple of years. I, I think tech IPO market certainly has been very active. I think last year there were 113 companies in technology that went public, and many of those were consumer and fintech companies. Um, and this year, we've we've had two. So I'm hoping 2023, 2024, 
um, have a few more. Um, but I was would share that you know certainly we talked a little bit about the valuation um, delta that we've seen since last year. I think that's not this similar um, in what's happening in fintech and and consumer internet versus you know softwares and other tech sectors. Um, but I think what's interesting in in fintech is that you know some of the models that are balance sheet heavy, obviously with the with the impact of rates and those business models, I think are seeing some challenges. And like all the other tech sectors, everyone's focused on you know profitability, improving the profitability. And um, I think some of these models are a little bit to be seen given the recessionary um, environment that we are in. So maybe some of that is going to take some time to play out in in the public markets. But I think just like software, just like internet and you know fintech, I think people are generally focused on durability of the growth and the business model going forward. Amazing. Yeah, thank you guys so much for introducing yourselves. Um, so we're going to kick things off with a quick round robin, uh, no pun intended. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'm going to ask you guys three questions. So one, are you guys currently bullish or bearish on consumer internet? Two, are you guys currently bullish or bearish on fintech and why? Uh, maybe let's start with Lucy down to, to Sagar. Uh, I wouldn't, I can never be bearish because in equities, you have to sell the dream, so you can never be there. Uh, so I, I would say, I mean, some of this um, in terms of consumer internet, um, the estimates certainly has been adjusted, right, in the public markets. And you see that, you know, the sell side estimate has been cut. And a lot of this is related to the sort of COVID impact on these these businesses. And what, what does that mean coming out of it? And what does durable growth or normalized growth look like in the next couple of years? So I'm hopeful for, you know, some of the companies that, you know, are still to come to the markets that can really figure out the business model while they're private. I mean, now's the good time to, to be private. And you know, by the time they come out in the next, I would say maybe 24, 25 era, hopefully the business models are a little bit more sound, the scale is there, and then also the unit economics of these businesses are a little bit more proven out. So I'm bearish, I mean, bullish. <laughs> <laughs> Freudian, Freudian slip, there you go. Freudian slip. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I, oh my gosh, like, is there another animal I can use? Uh, <laughs> but I, I think for consumer internet, um, I, I love consumer internet. So I think I will always be like bullish in that sense. Um, because I do think that like consumers will, it may not be like, oh, we invest in GCC. We're going to invest in GCC again. And like, I think business models will have changed, but like we like, what do you guys do at your free time? You probably spend it on your phone. Or like, you probably still want to spend money. Even if it's not on the latest pair of shoes, it will be buying something, right? And so I think that like, if like, what is exciting to me about like consumer and fintech is that like, that shift is happening. And it's happening in ways where like, we're meeting com like commerce activity at different ways. And like that embedded fintech, which we'll talk about later, is like a transition between like consumer to um, kind of like more uh, commercial and because I think a lot of uh, businesses and business owners are, you know, predominantly individuals who do use a lot of like iPhones or um, shop the way that they shop as a consumer will reflect the way that they do that as like a business owner. And so I think we'll start to see a lot of like the blend. Um, we start to see that at like Slack from adoption ground up, like people are taking what they use normally to work and in, in private lives. And I think, yeah, I'm excited to see how that will translate over to FinTech. So maybe a little bit bearish on consumer, but maybe more bullish on FinTech. Cool. Um, so I'll stick to talking about fintech because I don't do consumer internet and you guys are, are much smarter on that topic. I think, um, you know, if you step back, there's a lot of reasons to be bearish uh, on, on fintech right now, right? And I think our lot for, for good reason. I think we basically went through a period of two, three years where no one cared about unit economics, right? In <laughs> private markets, public markets, like it didn't matter. Um, you know, we saw plenty of rounds in the you know Series B, C, D stage getting valued at 20, 30 times gross revenue, right? Or even multiples on payment volume with no margin attached to it, right? Um, we saw lots of balance sheet heavy models get valued like they were asset light, um, which is you know coming back down to reality. And we saw poor retention uh, businesses, whether it's on the consumer side or the fintech or the B two B side get valued like top tier, uh, you know, infrastructure SaaS companies, right? So I think um, 
it, and, and now you're, you're seeing that, right, with, in the public markets with a lot of these companies that have IPO'd and spac in the last couple of years trading below cash value. And so I think there's a lot of stuff um, that, you know, the public market expressing its view on why that, those models should not be valued like they were over the last few years. But then I think if you just step back, you know, the things that got everyone in this room uh, excited about fintech three years ago, like none of that has changed, right? In a lot of ways, it's even gotten stronger, right? You think about just the total market cap out there from legacy financial services that's up for grabs over the next 10 years. You talk about all the new innovations around infrastructure, technology, banking as a service, a bunch of different uh, tools to let people launch new products faster and uh, more efficiently. Um, and uh, and I, I think you just, and, and then lastly, fundamentally, you just look at a consumer that only wants to consume financial products digitally, right? Like no one wants to go into branches anymore. And you think about it on the business side and people just want capital and financial products to work in as they operate their businesses. They don't want to just go get a bag of money, right? They want it to just work and make they it a lot easier. They don't want the paperwork associated with getting a bag of money, I guess. Um, so overall, I think I, you, we step back. I think a lot of what's happening in the market is, is good just for the long-term defensibility and sustainability of the industry. But I think it's everything, the time horizons are just going to be pushed out a little bit because it's, uh, it's it's brutal out there right now. There's but no you're right, though. It. Like, the digitization aspect of everyone's lives and how businesses and consumers operate is just never going to return back to what it was before. Totally. Yeah. No, very true. I think, you know, the fundamentally the same the same underlying systemic changes are happening. And, um, you know, we're at a different time in the market cycle that's prioritizing more profits. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll see how it develops over the next couple of months. But wanted to pivot it over to Lucy to give a bit more perspective um, on the public perception of fintech companies nowadays. So, how has the tone changed? I mean, you know, we've seen Marketo go public, Robinhood go public at high flying valuations and now coming crashing down to earth. What is it that you're hearing specifically about those companies? Um, what is the tone change on yeah. fintech? And I'd say 2021 certainly was very active. There were 22 companies in fintech that went public, and uh, two of them are trading above IPO price. It's not dissimilar to the broader tech IPO ecosystem. And, you know, on average, most of the companies, you know, together is, is down about 40 to 50 percent. And I think some of that is just the broader, I would say, valuation bubble, if you will, that we were all in, or maybe just the level that the broader market was in. So that has been adjusted. I think people certainly are focused on, um, you know, sort of the profitability or durability of the growth going forward. And I think if you look at I think rule of 40 is probably a, a metric that many investors use. They look at growth and they look at your bottom line. And I think, you know, someone like a Marketa, who was a very, I would say, successful IPO and certainly priced at very high valuations, um, I think today it trades at, I think, four times forward revenue. And that's because the, the growth has decelerated, right? Because as people continue to cut costs, growth has to come down. And if you have, if you still are not profitable, and I think some of the companies I would say, takes a little bit of time to get to profitability because I think there's a scale factor here too. But I think what's not being forgiven in the public market is that if you are super large in scale, if you have a billion dollar plus of revenue, and if you're still not profitable, then something is somewhat missing in the model. Um, whether it's just you're spending too much on sales and marketing, you're not efficient enough. And I think it's very similar to other sectors where people are focused on. Um, I do think, you know, given FinTech is, um, somewhat, I wouldn't say newer, but I think it is changing the, the sort of a large TAM that is uh, in investor or public investors' mind sort of slowly, or at least the institutions are probably slower to change. I think sometimes you know, that impacts people's view on how quickly can this business really grow? Because is your customer really going to, you know, especially on the BDB side, um, be able to adopt um, you know, new solutions right away? But I think on the consumer side, to Robin's point, um, I think some of the consumer names are going to be really interesting if you can have this viral model that a lot of you know, users can use in and potentially could, could even become something really large. I think that's what Im investors are really interested in. But I think in the short run, um, in terms of anybody accessing the market, it, it will have to be likely companies with profitability in yeah. the next six months. No, I think you're, you're totally right in that there's many synergies that we can learn from the consumer sector applied to fintech that can, that can help drive further growth. But I do think there needs to be more of an emphasis on UE and, and, and uh, profitability. But I want to bring it back now earlier, earlier stage and looking at the private markets um, and earlier stage fintech companies. 
So I wanted to turn it over to Robin, actually, um, you know, who you've been pretty active um, investing in the fintech space over the past uh, year or so uh, on GGV's behalf. And, you know, I just wanted to ask you, what's, what's excited you most about, you know, investing in fintech over these past couple of years? And how has your new focus on fintech, how does that fit in with your past theses on, you know, e-commerce and consumer internet in general? Yeah, I think like when we just had our offsite a week ago, we we put all of those logos onto one page and we're like, wow, we actually have like way more fintech investments than we thought because a lot of our uh, companies have actually evolved into having fintech in them called like, which we're calling embedded fintech. But in the past, we've done a lot on like the D2C side, right? We've have we've had like a firm, we've had Alibaba, which had Alipay. We also have um, StoryCard, uh, which was an investment we made um, based out of Mexico. Um, but w what we started to see was that a lot of the companies, particularly in the SMB side too was like we actually um we actually do a lot of transactions around like, oh, if I'm serving restaurants, um, uh, like from farm to restaurant, like that type of transaction, we're starting to embed more fintech solutions in it, right? And so like Frubana, which is a, a company that Hans is on the board of and that our investment in um, based out of Colombia, like they started to have like, um, Frubana Capital. Um, we're starting to see that with Slice here in the New York, which is powering like 30,000 plus pizzerias. Um, we're starting to see that with Odeco, which Dane was on stage with like over 13,000 coffee shops. And they're starting to come up with different solutions that have FinTech that is directly in the flow of their commercial activity. And not just like in just processing payment, but processing other things that are the lifeblood of that SMB. And so I think like we're starting to see the shift, like yes, e-commerce, um, in the past, we've done a lot in, which was traditionally touching the end consumer. We're now doing a lot around like the kind of the vendors or uh, as, as well as the owners who are um, then it's more like B2B to B2C. To and so I think we've seen that kind of shift as well. And in, from like an investment standpoint, um, we find that pretty exciting. I mean, you've worked on a couple of deals yourself. What, what excites you, Marcello? What excites me? Oh, uh, <laughs> well, you know, I'm also very interested in this embedded fintech theme. Um, I think, you know, we're seeing that, uh, you know, building back on, on Lucy's point about like synergies between consumer and fintech. Um, I think that fintech is pretty much directly inextricable from the flow of commerce. So in, in order to enable better commerce to happen, you need to have fintech right at the source of where transactions are happening. You can both leverage it to like drive higher conversion rates for consumer platforms, or you can leverage transactional data to be able to underwrite people more effectively um, when you when you do offer them financial services. So in my opinion, you know, kind of similar to Robin, um, you know, embedded fintech for us is something that's very interesting, and we're going to continue diving into it later later in the panel. Um, but uh, but yeah, exciting space for us, and we're doing more in fintech over the over the next couple of years. And um, yeah, so Sagar, wanted to turn it over to you. Um, I think you're, as you mentioned, in your in some of the companies that you've backed, Clio, um, Novo, and Lithic, these are more kind of on the B2B side, servicing enterprise customers, more infrastructure layer fintechs. Um, so why the exclusive focus on B2B for you? What do you see is so interesting about B2B versus you know, some of the more consumer-facing fintech companies that, that Robin was talking about or others are investing in? Sure. Yeah, I mean... Um Simplest reason is I invest in B2B companies. Uh, I, have a, I have colleagues that invest in the con consumer companies. But um, yeah, I think a, a couple of reasons why, why B2B fintech is, is exciting, right? Um, it, first of all, it, it uh, looks more like SaaS, right? All the things that we love about SaaS, high margin, recurring revenue, uh, growing uh, uh, expansion via uh, in increased consumption, all these things that are the trademarks of SaaS you see in a lot of these B2B fintech companies as well. Um, I think the other thing is uh, when you're serving businesses, and this goes to the embedded uh, thesis point also, because it's not uh, just pure play fintech companies, but broader uh, B2B companies that are offering financial services in it, there's a lot of different ways to monetize uh, an end customer, right? Um, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use Novo as an, as an example here, um, <laughs> and hopefully not stealing all of Michael's thunder on the panel, but you know, these guys are, it's a small business uh, bank account is how the company started, and that's the, today, uh, predominance of, of revenue through VA Interchange. But just in the last six months, they've launched four different product lines between you know, lending, instant transfers, 
uh, you know, they're making money on the float now. There's all these different things you can do and monetize that same consumer over uh, or uh, same business over and over again. So I think that, that that lots of bites of the apple is what what makes it super exciting. And then I think um, that's that's sort of on the branded side and when you're folk, when you're, when you're uh, serving and customers. But then on the infrastructure side, I think exactly what we're talking about. And maybe we're going to about to get into it even more. But on this embedded side, every company is becoming a fintech in some ways, right? If I just look at my portfolio that's not specific fintech, I have a couple B2B marketplaces, right, that both are uh, injecting financing and working capital solutions into the product to increase conversion rates, right? I have a couple HR companies that are on workforce management, so they, um, they help sort of run uh, businesses with lots of hourly workers that are injecting earned wage access into that product, right? So enabling the employee to access those funds before the two week pay cycle. So there's just a lot of these different use cases that are popping up in segments that you wouldn't have even expected um, for there to be financial services. Um, and so that's why you know I, I'm super, obviously, as I said in the beginning, bull bullish on this, this category over the long run in the next couple of years. Yeah, no, we definitely see some similarities in our portfolio where, you know, some of our fintech companies have a, a wedge product that they embed into some platform and then kind of expand horizontally and do, offer more financial services and kind of monetize that customer um, or increasing increase the share of wallet for that customer, both on the B2B side and the B2C side. Um, but I guess doubling down a little bit more on, on the B2B fintech thesis, um, what are some of the subsectors within B2B uh, that, that you're looking at, within B2B fintech specifically that you're looking at? You know, you've done card issuing. Um, you looked at SMB, SMB neo banking. Um, what are some of the other spaces that excite you over the next couple of years? Yeah, sure. I think um, I'll mention a couple different. I think just fundamentally on the infrastructure side, right? Like I think if you look at FIS, Fiserv, Jack Henry, you've got uh, probably 100, you might know better than me, let's see 130 <laughs> billion plus of market cap, right? That's sitting there um, in predominantly products that were built 30, 40 years ago, right? And I think, you know, on the one hand, there's a reason those companies are so valuable and profitable because once you get in there, it's really, really hard to rip the stuff out. And so it's not gonna be an overnight journey, but um, each of those uh, incumbents has, you know, 10 product lines generating, uh, you know, multi several hundreds, if not billions of revenue, right? Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, we're doing a lot of work uh, internally, just sort of dissecting those business models, understanding all the different verticals and value propositions that they have to all their different customers and seeing uh, where where there's opportunity for, for new entrants. And, you know, card issuing is, is one where we've, we've, where we've made a bet, but there's a whole host uh, of mm -hmm. stuff that you could just kind of go down the list on. Yeah, no, makes sense. All right, why don't we uh, dive a little bit deeper into this embedded fintech thesis that, uh, that Robin uh, and Sagar and, and a bunch of others have, have touched upon. Um, so, you know, as, as mentioned, you know, we've been doing a lot more uh, in terms of defining embedded fintech and, and investing in embedded fintech companies. And so I was wondering, you know, Robin, do you mind sharing a little bit more about, you know, what our embedded fintech thesis is? You know, what actually is embedded, fin embedded fintech um, and why is it even relevant in today's fintech landscape? Yeah, I, I think like before we kind of had that first wave of fintechs being a lot of in the last decade, like neo banks, right? A lot of um, the sim similar investment pattern as we did for e-commerce. We invested in a lot of DTC players, and then we did invest in a lot of platforms, right? Um, I feel like it's is somewhat similar or mirroring that in um, fintech as well. Like before we saw like Chime, we saw New Bank, we saw a lot of like um, Revolut and other European ones, all kind of like starting to bubble up and also doing the same thing, right? Like they they are leveraging like the brand and like go to market. But what we ended up like looking at a lot of these and not investing in a GGV because we felt like the one, the unit economics are very difficult to maintain, but like two, it's really like unsustainable CAC because on the consumer internet side, we invest in a lot of like those consumer platforms like TikTok, for example, and like, um, it's not very easy to control your CAC um, because they will like go up and down over time. And so like how much can you get out of a customer and like how much do you have to keep spending for that flywheel to keep going? Whereas embedded FinTech, you're like, I think what are some of the really interesting elements of it is that like one, like you're embedding it inside an existing platform already. And so an example of that will be um, like DoorDash, right? Like, um, you know, we all probably use DoorDash as like a consumer, but on like the 
the B2B side of DoorDash is like um, the merchant or the restaurant um, is like is actually using DoorDash to like power their transactions. But also where they're starting to be like, oh, maybe we could start lending to them, right? Or maybe we can start giving them um, early like early payment or early access to X, Y, Z in terms of like the goods that they have to buy and like um, how do you kind of leverage those buying power together and like embed different ways to monetize on them. And I think that like Novo we were talking about is doing somewhat similar in, in a different platform. But I mean, you've worked on a bunch of those type of embedded fintech thesis as well for yeah. us. And yeah. yeah, for sure. I mean, I think uh, uh, definitely from a CAC perspective, if you are integrating uh, into an established platform, it gives you that distribution that prevents you from having to, you know, go straight to the consumer and spend a lot on convincing them why your product is uh, is useful. And we've saw we saw in like the DTC fintech wave, um, you know, it's um, it's it's hard to differentiate your product when like everyone's offering the same neo banking solution. Like, what's the difference between a Revolut and a Monzo? What's the <laughs> difference between uh, uh, you know? Um, I don't know, new bank and an Albo. Um, so there are definitely, you know, slight differences, but from a UX experience, it's hard to convince the customer of that. So embedding into a platform really gives you that, that and platform has a reach and also the brand yeah. already. They're already spending on your behalf. Yeah. And I think also like from a trust perspective too, I think like if you're a fledgling fintech, uh, you're gonna have to spend a lot on acquiring customer, but if you're able to embed into a DoorDash, for example, which we've seen with Paraffin, uh, one of, one of, uh, one of the companies with, uh, within, within our network, um, you know, Paraffin uh, uh, leverages in, in many ways the DoorDash brand to be able to gain that credibility with the merchants um, uh, to distribute their product better. I, I think just to add on, I think what's what's so exciting about it, um, not just for the provider of the uh, financial service, uh, the embedded fintech, but for that the end company or the end platform is like there's two. It's twofold. It's uh, uh, obviously economics, right? You're just increasing your take and ARPU from that, that same customer, but also um, in stickiness, right? Because you're just, there's more uh, products and services that that end customer is now dependent uh, on you for. So it really is like a win-win-win if you look through the, um, if you look through the, the, the landscape. So I, I think, and we're already seeing it take off and I think the next couple of years is really, it's gonna accelerate even further. I yeah. actually like want to ask you and Lucy on your take on this because there's so many companies now that are like banking as a service, like credit as a service, <laughs> risk management as a service. And like, so when companies like um, embed them, they're like, okay, well, this is not our core competency, but like I'll sign up for this and that um, and then give away all these margins. But for those companies, like the banking as a service companies, we're like, is this like a category that like, VCs invented and are just like dumping money in or like from like a public market perspective, you're like, oh, are they actually sustainable? And they each actually have some type of dif differentiation around them besides mm -hmm. brand. I've probably seen this more on the maybe SaaS side. That's like, you know, and you think about like all the vertical software companies, right? Like if you're like a service titan or someone like that who has you know thousands or not hundreds of thousands of smaller you know kind of I would say SMB businesses on your platform, and your first is to sell them the software that makes the whole process work. Then you're like, well, yeah, I'm already your critical system, so why don't I get get paid or payments on this pro process as well, right? So that's I feel like that's a almost like a playbook that many of the SaaS companies are, are starting to add on as a second line of you know sort of income or, or you know revenue stream. I think ultimately it's going to be that revenue comes at a lower gross margin than your SaaS or software mo models, right? So I think it's a little bit of this, like eventually when you get to the mature size, what does this company look like? But I agree, it's a it's a kind of a non-friction way of adding another line of revenue. Yeah, and I think specifically on sort of the bank as a service platforms that have all popped up over the last couple of years, my, my view is that they're really they're perfect fits for companies who are looking to add financial products and don't imagine that the financial products will be core to their business um, and like what they do at, mm -hmm. at its core. Because I think if you're in a, well, all you do is financial services, bank, you're gonna scale out of the banking as a service platform, right? Yeah. You're, it doesn't make sense to have all these things in one tool. You should get Lithic for card issuing. You should get Alloy for compliance. You should get all these tools that are, that are best of breed. But I do think there's a really big portion of the population that just need a checking account, right? Or just need a bank account. Maybe they need a card attached to it, maybe not. And I think for those, the banking as a service providers make 
make a lot of sense. Mm. Yeah, I think we have time maybe for one more question, um, and I want to wrap up with uh, kind of going back to something that that Neil and Lucy were talking about in terms of the um, pre-IPO stage uh, and like how do we best advise our companies to IPO in this environment that's super difficult. So looking forward for the next two three years, like how should businesses be be uh, best best position themselves? So I guess elect, uh, no, <laughs> Robin and uh, and Sagar. Uh, would be curious to hear your takes on what have you guys been telling portfolio companies, specifically fintech portfolio, to focus on, um, especially the ones that are looking to IPO within the next uh, the next couple of years. Um, what are some of the tangible advice or nuggets that that, that they should be focused on? Okay. Sure, I'll, I'm happy to go. I mean, for me, it's it's one thing. Well, maybe not just this thing, but this is 80% of what we're talking about right, right now is how to drive gross profit margin, right? Yeah. Because I'm not joking when no one was focused on this, right, for, for several <laughs> years, right? Like, oh, look at the volume, just going like this, and look at the margin, staying staying flat, right? So to me, like, you know, and, and I think if you look at the public comps, like the, the folks that have no gross profit margin are getting hammered, right? And um, so, and to me, I'm optimistic that you, you we're going to make progress on, on this because, you know, again, w with no focus, you're not, it's, it's going to have a certain result. I think once you actually focus on it, start prioritizing certain deals and customers be based on the profitability rather than the volume, I think it will, I think it will come over time. But to me, that's the, that's the number one thing that if, in, in order to get public scale, that has to, that has to be there. Hmm. Yeah. And I think for us, like, um, it's, it's working together with a company to, one, build those relationships with the J.P. Morgans and the later capital um, markets folks um, uh, to make sure you have that type of readiness. But even, even then, like, I think we'll touch on this on the next panel is like, um, and Huey would talk about it, is making sure like your risk um, officers and chief risk officers and that risk team is in place because so much of these platforms are like, oh, um, like this is the first time they're going into a recessionary environment. Like, how do, do, do they really know how to underwrite the risk that they're getting into and their, their, their customers are getting into? Um, and I think that for like, at least on the GGV side, we've been working a lot to help beef up that team, assess that team, um, both from a technical standpoint, but um, like with the data side, but also the risk side as well. So. Yeah. I mean, provide you know, pro a lot of our portfolio companies are trying to you know provide new lending services, but you know it's it's a, it's a hairy business line to to tackle. Uh, it's it's uh, so having that experienced team, but also being cognizant that like the past five years with low interest rates and you know disposable income increasing, you know it's easier to pay back your loan in that situation. It's easier to keep a low cost of capital, but now as rates are going up, you know cost of capital increases, disposable income drops. You know you're starting to see that crunch there, and so like. <coughs> Are we really well positioned as a team? Are we really well positioned, you know, um, from a credit risk underwriting perspective, to be able to withstand? Will our models withstand the <laughs> test of the of the recession? Yet to be seen. With the last minute, um, just very quick question for all three of you: soft landing by the Fed or hard landing by the Fed? So I gotta pick soft landing. I feel, I feel it's gotta come back at some point, you know. So yeah. Yeah. I'll I'll be contrarian. <laughs> Hard landing. Yeah. They, they, I don't know if they know what they're doing up there, over there. <laughs> it's a bit academic. I think a VC, you got to be an optimist, so soft landing. <laughs> All right, soft landing. All right, we'll end on that. Thank you guys so much for coming up today. It's great to hear from you guys.